Hey guys, welcome. Let's go ahead and worship together today. Jesus, we say thank you for the joy that we have in this season, Lord. We set our eyes and our hearts on you today. And we sing out in worship. Let's sing together. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. His love. 
We are so excited to be here with you. Amen, right? Would you turn to someone that you know and that you don't know? Maybe give them a high five, shake their hand, fist bump, maybe even a hug if they, you know, shake them like this. as we uh, continue worshiping together, I have been really moved. My kids and I usually memorize in scripture in the Bible, we're at Luke 2, and I think it's verse 12, where it says that, and an army of angels came. And the word that's really been moving me this Christmas is, it says, and they praised that Jesus was born. And I have not been able to stop thinking about that every day because these songs, as Gideon was saying earlier, they're Christmas songs to us, but they were worship. The angels knew they lost Jesus in heaven and here he is with us and they worshiped at this plan of redemption that God began with his son who was born, then grew, died on the cross and rose again and they rejoiced. And I thought, what would it look like if these traditional Christmas songs that we sing and most of us know, if we had just a piece of that joy that those angels had the day that Jesus was born? How different would my worship come out if I had that understanding of what Jesus did for me? that this isn't about presence, that it isn't about traditions, but it is about the King of Kings. And so I just wanna invite you as we sing these songs this Christmas season, that you ask the Lord for that joy, that you ask the Lord for that understanding of the true gift that it was to send His Son.
out today and sing that out this morning. All our affections for you, our affection, our devotion, poured out on the feet of Jesus, our affection. Come on, let's join in with the angels in heaven. Sing it out. It's our affection, our devotion, poured out on the feet of Jesus. Our affection, our devotion, poured out on the feet of Jesus. We love you. Yes, we love you. Christmas that it is because of love. It is because of your word that says that we love you because you first loved us. Thank you, Jesus, that you took the form of a servant, that you humbled yourself. And just even thinking of that, that line in Silent Night, that glory streamed from heaven afar, but then heaven came close. Heaven came close on that Christmas morning, and that's what we celebrate, that we have Emmanuel, God with us, heaven that is close, that we can experience, that we can taste and see of your goodness. God, we love you. Thank you for first loving us. We ask that you would make this season more than tradition over these next few weeks but that we would encounter your love in a new and just such a beautiful way. God, I pray this and I ask for this in the mighty name of Jesus. I thank you for what you're gonna share through our friend Lorenzo today, God. I ask that it would go beyond the surface level and that it would produce life today because it is by your spirit. God, we say thank you. We welcome you. We pray this together in the mighty and powerful and blessed name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God, thanks for worshiping together with us. Yeah. Give it up to the Let's go ahead and take a seat. Thank you. Do me a favor. 
Repeat after me, all right? Listen up. I will invite one person to church. I will invite my whole family to church for, for Christmas Eve and for New Year's Eve. Services at the same time. Also, we're having baptisms. Christmas baptisms. Make some noise for Christmas baptisms. Cool. December 24th, so you can sign up today. Link is on the screen. Matter of fact, hey, Alan, come here real quick. Okay, here we go. What do you get when you mix baptisms with a basketball game? What? A dunking contest. <laughs> Hey, City Travers and anybody else who wants to join us, we want you to be thinking about what you're going to fast from during our annual 21 days of prayer and fasting that starts January the 7th and lasts through January the 28th. Some people do a combination of fasting, like fasting from chocolate, meat, and social media. Some people fast from Netflix. You may want to fast from all foods, but whatever you do, just sit and ask God to reveal to you in your heart and mind the things you're to fast from during our annual 21 days of prayer and fasting, January the 7th through the 28th. Well, hey there, City Tribe. It's Johnny here from Liberty Church London. We just want to say greetings. It is great to see you all. I also want to give a little bit of an update, and I don't know if you can see behind me, but I'm stood in front of St. Paul's Cathedral, one of the most incredible buildings in the entire city of London. You, if you if you can see it, you're probably getting Mary Poppins vibes right now. This is where the Feed the Birds things happens. Uh, we love this building. I love this building because this building was built as a monument, a place for people to come and gather and celebrate Jesus. But since this building was built, some things have changed. You see, London is a very different city to what it was. There was a time in history where missionaries went out from London into the world to bring the good news of the gospel. But sadly, it's not like that anymore. There's still an existing law in place which says that buildings built in this area cannot block the view of St. Paul's Cathedral because it was always seen as so important that everyone could see it and be reminded of the good news of Jesus. But they're thinking of changing that law. Why? because they don't see the good news of Jesus as something to value. London at, at one point was the most Christian city in the world. And right now, less than 2% of any Londoners would ever attend a church service. Just to put that into context, 13% uh, of Londoners are, are Muslim and would regularly attend a mosque. Where Liberty Church London is, in our little part of East London, 37% of the local community are Muslim and attend a mosque. This city, which was once where missionaries went from, needs missionaries. We need churches. And that's why we're here. That's why we planted Liberty Church London four years ago, to reach this city with the good news of Jesus. But do you know something really cool when you reach London? London's the opposite of Las Vegas, right? What happens in London doesn't stay in London. What happens in London goes out and influences the world. So we're excited about influencing this city with the good news of Jesus and then this city influencing the world once again. What we do here won't stay here and we want the good news of Jesus to go out from this place and we want to see revival in London, across the UK, across Europe and across the world. And your support is really helping make that happen. So I just want to say thank you so much for standing with us, standing with us as partners in the gospel, in the good news of Jesus. You know, one of the things that I love about our church is our generosity towards other places in the world, like Liberty London, uh, like our dear friends in Liberia, Africa, as well as Chihuahua, Mexico, and uh, serving those who are under-resourced here in San Antonio at Strong Foundation Ministry for Homeless Families. And so as we approach the end of year, we're all praying about what we would want to do above and beyond our regular tithes and offerings in order to help fund ministries around the world that are serving people that desperately need not only food and 
clothes and things like that, but most of all, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so that's where we're praying about what we could contribute towards what's called the Tribal Missions Fund uh, before the end of this year. We're praying that God would provide all $86,000 that we need to help fund the ministries um, that are outside of our church uh, that we've made commitments to. So would you guys join me in praying about that for your life, just as Jeannie and I are praying about that for our personal finances before end of year? Um, so before we continue on in the service, I just wanted to celebrate for a minute uh, awesome men's and women's conferences that we had here this past weekend. Thank the Lord for that right on. And so many thanks to, uh, of course, Pastor Pedro and uh, Priscilla who helped uh, facilitate those conferences that serve so many men and women over the weekend here at our church. And today for our teaching, a dear friend of mine is going to come up and share with us. But before uh, I introduce him, would you mind to just bow with me in prayer and ask God by his spirit to help us? So Holy Spirit, we say welcome and we place our hands out to receive from you. We open our minds to you, Holy Spirit. We open our hearts to you, Holy Spirit, because we don't want to just go through the motions and check out the box of church this week, but we want to hear from you, encounter you. It's all about you, Jesus. And so we know that your word is holy and inspired to penetrate our hearts, and it cuts through all the baloney in this world and gets right to the heart of the matter. And we open our hearts to you, Holy Spirit, that through the holy inspired word, we would be changed. I pray for those of us that have been Christ followers for many years, that we would hear something that we need to hear. And for those that are uh, just trying to figure out if God is for real spiritual investigators, I pray that you would reveal yourself to them in a special and a unique way that only you can do, God. So we thank you for what you're going to do and pray these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Everyone said Amen. Well, my dear friend that's going to come and share with us today, uh, he was instrumental in starting up a tech co-working space in downtown called Geekdom. Uh, uh, he's also one of the uh, uh, advisory board members here at City Tribe Church, leads an awesome men's group as well. And these days, vocationally, he's uh, an author. He's written three awesome books that are out now, and he's got a fourth one on the way. Um, some of those books have been uh, Amazon bestsellers, super great books. And in addition to that, he's working on creating micro districts in urban parts of San Antonio uh, in real estate. So um, would you guys give a rowdy and warm City Tribe welcome to my good friend, Lorenzo Gomez III. Hello. Good morning. All right. Um, the title of this message this morning is called A Resurrection for You. And uh, this is a story about Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. It's one of my favorite stories in the Bible. And I just want to share it with you because it's, it's such a beautiful, rich story. I think there's a lot of lessons that we can draw out of it. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to put up a question that I want you to ponder and we're going to read the scripture. It's a little bit of a longer text, but we're going to read the whole thing. And then I'm going to do what I call a spiritual drive-by. We're going to go back in the car. We're going to drive by it. I'm going to pull over and I'm going to point out some things in the story. And then I'm going to ask you some questions that I want you to ponder in the story. And I hope you'll get a lot out of it. So um, the first question I want you to ponder before we do the reading is what part of your life needs a resurrection? I think that maybe God brought someone here who's struggling with something. Maybe you need uh, some joy. Maybe you need your, your hope resurrected. And I think that this story is going to give you two double barrels of that resurrection power that God has. So if you will, please stand with me while we do the reading of God's word. This story is found in the book of John chapter 11, and I'm just going to read it through you. So just bear with me. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha 
and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had been, that Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they said. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped in strips of linen with a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this story. And I thank you that you're still the God that has resurrection power. I thank you that you've brought people here to encourage them and to spark a new life within them, Heavenly Father. And Lord, I ask that you would bless this message and that the words that I speak be your words and not mine. And we pray and ask all these things in your son's name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take a seat. All right. This story is so good. I'm going to try not to get too excited about it, right? This story is about Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And there's two stories about a guy named Lazarus in the Bible. There's one about a guy named Lazarus who died, and then a rich man also died. And this is not that story. This is a story about three siblings, a guy named Lazarus, and he had a sister named Martha and another sister named Mary. This is a different Mary than the mother of Jesus, okay? So first thing we see, it's about a family. Anybody here have some siblings, okay? So I want you to imagine that you and your siblings are somewhere and you meet Jesus and he becomes your friend. That's basically what happened in this story. This is a really incredible notion to me that Jesus actually had friends that he picked. So I want you to think about that, that it's about three siblings. The second thing I want you to know is that next week we're going to be celebrating Christmas Eve, which is the birth of Jesus, the beginning of his life. And I'm doing it backwards this week. I'm taking you to the very end of Jesus's life. This story takes place, scholars believe, between two to three weeks before they actually crucify Jesus. So we're seeing him at the end of his time on earth in this story. And there's just so many goodies in here. It's like a movie. There's a couple of uh, goosebump moments that I'm going to point out to you. Uh, but I want you to keep in mind about this story. So let's ponder the first question. The first question that I want you to ponder is, do you understand the love that Jesus has for you? Jesus loves you. 
But we hear that said a lot, and it can sound a little bit cliche, but I want to show you how rich and awesome the love of Jesus is. So in the Greek language, which the New Testament was written in, the Greek language is so much more descriptive than English. And so when they use the word love, there's four different definitions for the word love in Greek. And I've just put them in here for you. The first one is philia, which is the love of deep friendships. The second one is eros, which is a passionate romantic love. The third one is storge, and storge is a love that a mother would have for her newborn child. It's this really, really primal love. And the last one, which is probably the most famous, is agape love. This is this selfless, unconditional love. And C.S. Lewis wrote a great book about this called The Four Loves. And so you need to understand that when the word love is used, there are different meanings, but it's so, so rich. And what's interesting to me about this story is that Jesus uses two of these four words to describe these three siblings. That's how much he loved them. It's really incredible to me. So let's go back into the passage. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one that you love is sick. That word love in the Greek is philia. That is the affect, affectionate love of deep friendships. So let me ask you a question. Anybody here have a BFF? Okay, Jesus had some BFFs, and it was Mary, Martha. Some of them are here right now with you. Give him a little elbow. You know, C.S. Lewis has a great quote about friendship that I really love. He said, friendship is born at the moment when one person says to another, what? You two? I thought I was the only one. Anybody here have a friendship that started with going, oh my God, that's your favorite movie too? For me, it's The Godfather. You love that restaurant too? That's your favorite show? That's your favorite musician? You're a Swifty too? No judgment against Swifties here. But think about this notion. This is the word for love that God is using to describe Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. That word love, friendship. Imagine being at a cafe and Jesus walks up and says, oh my God, you love that? You love that dish too? I love that too. I think we think of Jesus as this far removed guy. And here he shows us that he wants to be your friend, right? And ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you, there's a lot of people in this world that need to feel the filius love of Jesus. They are alone. Maybe someone, maybe God brought someone here who's struggling with loneliness. And God wants this love to hit you right in the heart. He wants to show you that he loves you. Look at this passage in Proverbs. It says, a man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Some of you have been hurt and you're struggling with loneliness, but God is coming up to you today and he's saying, I have a philia love just for you. I want you to be friends with me the way that I was with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. What an incredible message that is. So here's the next love. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, John eleven five. 5. This word love in the Greek is agape, this selfless, unconditional love. And I just think it's just so incredible. And so when I was preparing for this, I just thought there's this whole notion of BFF, you know, everybody has a BFF. Just if you don't know, this is what the kids say. It's best friends forever. And so I'm convinced that if this story happened in 2023 in San Antonio, Texas, I'm convinced that Jesus would have bought Mary, Lazarus, and Martha uh, this James Avery charm bracelet, okay? He would have, there's no doubt in my mind that he would have spent the $58, okay, to get him this BFF bracelet. Uh, anybody here ever get a James Avery piece of jewelry? Uh, when I was in high school, if you bought James Avery for someone, you were getting married, okay? It was a big deal, <laughs> right? I'm convinced that Jesus would have had a couple of these charm bracelets for them, and they would have wore them proudly. He wants to be your friend, and he loves you. Let's ponder the next question. Did you know that God's timing and our timing are rarely the same. Look at the, look, let's go back into the story, right? He's here, and it says, so when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. Then Jesus said to his disciples, let's go back. This is so scary to me as someone, because when I'm in a crunch and when I'm in a disaster, I want Jesus to show up right now. I want him to show up yesterday, before the disaster. But here Jesus is showing us 
that the disaster is happening. And he's like, nah, I'm cool. I'm just going to stick around for a couple more days. And so I was like, imagine getting, imagine sending Jesus this text message. You send him this text message. He's like, I'm sick. I'm going to die at any second. Okay. I need you to come here and help me. And Jesus says, no, nah, it's all good. I got it. I'm going to be, a, give me four days, four days and I'll show up. And this is what we do to God every day. We go, go, Lord, my finances are a disaster. My car's about to be repossessed, and I need you to show up. And God's like, no, I'm cool. I got it. Don't worry. I got it. And this is what's so hard. And what God is showing us is that he wants us to know that he does not operate on our timeline. He wants us to know that he exists outside of time, outside of space and time. He's that big a God. And even if your brother dies, he's like, I can still do whatever I want. What an incredible, incredible notion. So let's go to the next question to ponder. Do you need a comforter or a counselor? You know, we just came out of a pandemic and there was a lot of people that lost a lot of loved ones. Maybe you're struggling with that now. And I feel like as Christians, sometimes we want to give everybody that right passage to make everything better, that right thing that's going to cheer them up. But Jesus does something so radical in this story that it really, really blew my mind. And so he gets to the town and Martha comes up to him first. And then Mary comes up and they both say the exact same thing to Jesus. They say, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. It's, it's an exact quote. But Jesus' response to both of them is completely different. He, first to Martha, he says, your, your brother will rise again. And she goes, I know he'll rise again. And at the end, and he goes back and forth with her. It's almost a mini sermon that he gives her, right? That's really, that's really weird to me. And then Mary comes. She falls down, and he's absolutely overcome with emotion. He's overcome with emotion. And I think that what this story is showing us is that God knows exactly how to handle us at our weakest, most vulnerable moments. He knows exactly what you need. He knows that some of you need the lightest, gentlest tap, a little kiss on the forehead. He knows when you just need that hug, but he also knows when you need a little kick in the nalguitas. He knows when you need a little lecture. That's what he does to Martha. He says, your theology is all wrong. But to Mary, he's overcome with emotion. And I think that he wants you to know that he's not going to treat you the same as everybody else. He knows exactly what you need, and he knows the right dosage to give you. And he wants to give it to you. He wants to show you. And I just think it's so incredible how he just changes his approach with both of them. So we're coming up to one of my first goosebump moments in the story. I love it. So Jesus says to Martha, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he'll rise again on the last day. And then Jesus drops this nuclear bomb of a line that I love. And he says, I am the resurrection and the life. <sighs> Gives me goosebumps every time. She's so distraught over the death of her brother. And he says, I am the resurrection and the life. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you, this is the most controversial seven words of this entire talk. These seven words are the most important seven words that you'll hear me talk today. This is the most radical claim that anyone has ever made. There's a lot of people out there in the world that'll say, you know, Jesus, he was a good teacher and he had some cool philosophies and maybe we should pay attention. That is not what Jesus is saying here. Jesus is saying, I am God. And not only am I God, I have the power to resurrect the dead to life. And not only do I have the power to resurrect the dead to life, I am life itself. I am the giver of life and I am the creator of life. This is the most radical statement that you'll ever hear in your entire life. There is no other religion that makes a claim like this. There's no other prophet. There's no other guru. There's no other Jedi master. Nobody literally makes a claim this radical. And this is what Jesus is saying. This is why the Christian religion is so divisive because he is claiming to be God. Friends, this is the reason why the Bible is the most smuggled book of all time. It's the most banned book of all time. And it's the most sold book of all time. Because if this statement is true, we have to completely turn our lives upside down and submit to him as our master. And if it's not true, then he's crazy. And every one of us that believes in him are also crazy. But there's no middle ground. This is an incredible statement. This is the entire gospel in seven words. 
It's just so remarkable. So he's there. The sisters are coming up to him. And something happens that really has always bothered me over the years. He gets upset. Jesus gets upset. Why is Jesus upset? And I'm going to go a little bit of a nerd on you right now. I'm going to go, I'm going to go into the translation nerd. So it says in these two passages, right? First, when Martha comes, sorry, when Mary comes, he sees her weeping and the Jews along with her weeping. And it says he was deeply moved in spirit. And then in the next line, it says, Jesus once more deeply moved, goes to the tomb. So he sees Mary and he's deeply moved. And then he goes to the tomb and is deeply moved. And one of my favorite pastors is a guy named Tim Keller. And he said that the original translators of this were scared of the translation. They were scared to tell you what it really says. And so I've put it in parentheses. This first deeply moved in spirit says to quake with rage. He is upset. And in the second one where he goes to the tomb, that translation says to roar or snort with anger like a lion or a bull. So a better reading of that phrase should be Jesus bellowing with anger goes to the tomb. This completely changes the story. And so it begs the question, why is he upset? But I want to point out something for you that in this story, you see Jesus go through the full range of the human emotions that you and I go to. He goes, he's upset, he weeps, it says he weeps, and then he's very angry. So let me ask a question. Anybody here ever lost anybody and you've gone through those stages, the stages of grief? You're upset, you're angry, and I want you to know that God is not removed from your emotions. He's not separating himself. He feels exactly what you feel, the exact way you feel it. And he does it here. But over the years, this has bothered me. I'm like, why is he so upset? He knows he's going to raise him from the dead. He knows it's about to be awesome. Why is he so upset? And I've asked myself this question. And I think the answer is, is that he's angry at death. I think that Jesus is staring at the tomb of one of his best friends. And I think he's remembering the Garden of Eden where it was perfect, where him and his father would walk and commune with Adam and Eve and everything was perfect. And he's remembering it. And I think he might be seeing, I did not design it to be this way. I did not design death in the garden, but something happened. And when he created man, he also gave us free will, the free will to choose to do right or wrong. And because we chose to sin, our sin brought death into the world. And Jesus is staring at that tomb and he's thinking, I remember a time when there was no death. And he's also thinking of the future. And there's a time in the future, can I tell you, when there is no death. But he knows the only way to get there is he will have to go to the cross and he will have to die. And he's so upset about it. And he's thinking, there's only one way for me to take care of death once and for all. And that's, I'm going to go die. And I'm going to go down into hell and I'm going to wrestle death to submission, and I will take away all his power. And friends, can I tell you, that's good news. In the book of Revelations, it says, I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. And in, that, in Revelation 20, he says, then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Can I tell you, can I give you a spoiler alert? At the end of the story, death is defeated, and he throws death into the lake of fire. Amen. We can clap for that. So my next question is, do you have to see and then believe? And what I mean by that is, in this story, he goes up to Martha, and he says, hey, roll away the stone so I can get in there. And she gives him all these excuses. Lord, you know, uh, he's been there four days. He might stink. And then he drops the second goosebump line of the story that I love. Gets me every time. He looks at her and he says, didn't I tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Anybody here need to see the glory of God? He wants you to believe. This is so interesting. And this is hard for us as modern Americans because in modern America and in the West, we, are, we believe in modern rationalism. And modern rationalism says, if I can't see it, I don't have to believe it, right? But Jesus here says, I want you to take the first step. I want you to choose me. 
right? If you believe, you will see the glory of God. And I just want to take a, a moment here because some of you might be spiritual investigators and you're just checking this out. And I have heard so many people that have said, I was praying and I just prayed this prayer, Lord, I don't know if you're real, but if you are, show up. And I believe that he has the power to do that. And I believe he still does that. But his heart is this. His heart is he wants us to choose him first. And then you will see the glory of God. How incredible. Our next question is, do you smell that? There's a stinky smell coming up here. Let me tell you. And in this story, Jesus goes to the tomb. He says, take away the stone. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. And I, I, I'll tell you, when I read this, it made me think of uh, one of the greatest philosophers uh, in modern history, Nacho Libre. And if you remember this movie, I want you to repeat the line for me because he's out with Encarnacion. And she says, Ignacio, where are your robes? They were, fill in the blank, they were stinky. Okay. So that's what they're telling Jesus. Jesus, don't open that tomb. It is a stinky in there, okay? And he wants to get in there. He doesn't care if it's stinky. And friends, I, I want to tell you that I think that this is what we do with Jesus. I believe that every single one of us has a hidden tomb in our heart somewhere. And in that tomb, we have put all of the stinky parts of our life in there. And we tell Jesus, Jesus, please don't go in that part of my life. It is stinky. And we hide it from the people around us that love us. We say, don't go into that part. Don't ask about that part of my past because it's stinky. But Jesus wants to get in the tomb. He doesn't care if it's stinky. This is a little, this is just a short list of Lorenzo Gomez's stinkiness in my tomb. And can I tell you that the devil doesn't want you to open the tomb. He wants you to stay rolling around dead, spiritually dead in your stinkiness. And so he might whisper something to you like he does to me. He says, look at that, Lorenzo. Unforgiveness, man, what, what a horrible example. Look at you, divorced. Why are you even on that stage, divorced? Look at you. Lust, you struggle with lust, you're just a pervert. And the devil is whispering to me, you're just an unforgiving, grudge-holding, divorced pervert. And I want you to know that Jesus is standing outside the tomb. And he's saying, Lorenzo, roll the tomb away. Roll the stone away and let me in there. And I can redeem everything in there. I can redeem everything I can wash all that sin whiter than snow. The Bible says that Jesus can take your sin and separate it as far as the east is from the west. He said, it's not too stinky for me. And friends, I want to challenge you to roll away the stone and let him in there. It is not too stinky for Jesus. He wants to redeem you and he can. So how do we do it? How do we let him in to clean the stinky part of our life? You have to die to yourself. In the book of Luke, it says, Then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will be saved. We have to lay down our life. And the problem with laying down our life is that we as a people have a plan. Most of us have a plan for our life. Lord, I have a plan for my career. I have a plan for my family. I have a plan for my my finances, and we're trying to get Jesus on board with our plan. They're like, Lord, I want you to get on board with my schedule, right? I want you to collaborate with me on my terms. And that's not how Jesus wants it. He says, I need you to die to yourself and surrender all your plans to me. And that is really hard for us. But can I tell you that he's a good God and he has a better plan? In the book of Jeremiah, he says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Anybody here need a plan like that with hope and future? Amen. So what happened to Lazarus? <clears throat> In this story, Jesus goes and he, he yells, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus comes back from the dead. He walks out of the tomb. He's wrapped in linen, looks like a mummy. They have to go help him to get it out. And this is just incredible. 
And it was so incredible that it caused such an uproar for that time that it changed everything. Go with me to John 12. It says, meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. This resurrection, this miracle was so powerful and it caused so many people to believe in Jesus that the authorities said, we got to kill this guy. Poor Lazarus, right? He's dead. He goes back to life. Now they want to kill him again, right? The guy can't catch a break. And I want you to know that when God resurrects something in your life, it's going to tick off a lot of people. There are a lot of people that want that part of you to stay dead, to stay quiet, and they will try to kill you too. It'll be your, they'll try to kill your character. They'll try to assassinate your self-esteem. But Jesus wants you to do it anyway, just like he did with Lazarus. When I was reading, uh, when I was doing my research for this talk, there was a great book that I read, um, and Doug had actually recommended it a while back. It's called Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. And, you know, there's someone here, and a lot of people have been told, oh, you can't trust the Bible. It's a bunch of fairy tales. It's written so long ago. And I want you to know that there is so much historical evidence for these stories. There were so many eyewitnesses, right, that there are just books like this one where scholars go through all of this data and research it and just find these insights. And I want to give you one of them. I was reading about this, and Lazarus really isn't mentioned much after this, but there's a story that a commentator told that really blew my mind. And it takes place in the Garden of Gethsemane. If you don't know the Garden of Gethsemane, it's right before Jesus gets arrested. And he's in the garden and he's tormented by the weight of what he's about to do. It says that he sweat blood. He's tormented. And then he prays this incredible prayer. He says, Lord, if it's possible, please let this cup pass from me. Please don't make me go do what I'm about to do. And he says, but nevertheless, not my will. Yours be done. And the scholars say, they ask this really awesome question. Say, who was standing next to Jesus close enough to hear that prayer and write it down? In the Bible, it says that all the disciples fell asleep, right? And he, and he actually gets mad at them. He's like, you couldn't stay awake with me? There's so many scholars that believe that it was Lazarus that was sitting next to him and that wrote down this powerful prayer. And I just think it's a wonderful story. Who knows if it's true or not? But let me ask you a question. If Jesus had raised you from the dead, wouldn't you follow him? Wouldn't you sit at his feet? I think that God brought someone here because he wants you to follow Jesus for the very, very first time. <clears throat> so we're going to go into a time of prayer right now. And one of the things we do at City Tribe is we invite people to come down and to come pray down here. And I want you to know that uh, we're going to do two prayers the first prayer is going to be for anybody that God's got a hold of your heart today and he wants you to accept him, to believe in him for the first time. And then we're going to do a prayer of resurrection for the things that you need. And I want to put this slide back on there because I want you to think about the things in your life that need resurrection. Maybe some of you need a resurrection in your relationships or your marriage. Maybe you need a resurrection in your finances. Maybe you need resurrection in your hope and your self-esteem. But God wants to do a resurrection in you today. And he's sent this message here and he's used this story of Lazarus to show you that he is still in the business of resurrection. He still has resurrection power. So I want to invite anyone that wants to come and pray. Just come down if you feel led. You don't have to. For the rest of us, let's just close our eyes and bow our heads. Lord, I thank you that you're the God of resurrection power. And Lord, I just ask you today that you would come into this room and that you would minister to many hearts that are here. Lord, you brought someone here because they've been evaluating you, Lord. And right now, their heart is being tugged on. And it's saying, I want to have a relationship with you. I want to show you the four loves that I have for you. And so someone here right now, that you're open to accepting Jesus in your heart for the very first time. I just want you to pray this prayer in, in your heart with me as we pray. Lord, I thank you that you brought me here today. I thank you for this message of resurrection and hope. 
And Lord, the best I know now, Lord, I ask that you would come into my life. I believe that you came down from heaven and that you lived a perfect life. And that after that perfect light, you went to the cross willingly and you died, were crucified. But on the third day, you resurrected. On the third day, you resurrected and now you sit at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. And Lord, the best I know, I ask you to come into my heart and to change me so that I can be someone who shines your resurrecting power to the people in this world and to the people around me in my life. And we thank you for that. While, you're, while your heads are still bowed and your eyes are closed, if any of you prayed that prayer, just look up at me. I just want you to look up. Thank you so much. I see you. God bless you. And as our eyes are still bowed and our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, this next prayer is for the, res the things that we need resurrected in our life. Lord, I thank you. Just like Jesus said, I thank you that you hear our prayer so that many people would see and that they would believe. And Lord, I ask that you would unleash your resurrection power in this room right now. And everybody watching online, Lord, there are people that are struggling, that are struggling with sickness and sorrow and depression and discouragement. And you stand at the tomb and you say, roll away the stone because I want to redeem it. And I am the God who still has resurrecting power, Lord. I ask that you would open their hearts and that you would go in the tomb and that you would resurrect the area of their, the life that they needed. And now I would ask you to just fill in the blanks. Just whisper it, say it in your mind. Tell Jesus what you need resurrected. Maybe you're praying for someone else, someone in your life, a friend, a loved one, and they need God's resurrection power. Just lift it up to him right now in the name of Jesus, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, as you're, as you're healing people, as you're encouraging them, Lord. I thank you for your resurrecting power, Lord. And Lord, as we close this prayer, we want to give you thanks because it said in this story, if you believe, you would see the glory of God. And I believe right now that in these prayers, you are going to show us the glory of God so that when these prayers are answered, that we would point to heaven and say that there is a God in heaven who still has resurrection power. We thank you ahead of time. We pray as if it's already happened, Lord, and we thank you and we pray all of these things in the only name in heaven and earth that has any power, and that's the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. We bless you and praise you. Amen. Let's respond in worship and celebrate the life from the life giver himself. If you'd like to stand or if you want to stay kneeling or however, we are going to celebrate though the life-giving power, the resurrection life that we experience through Christ. Jesus, thank you that you never leave us where we're at, but you always take us on the journey with you and produce life in life abundantly. Come on, let's worship. Was buried beneath my shame. Whoa. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I made you. Shout this 
today for his kindness and goodness to us. Right on, right on. Awesome. Will you guys go ahead and take a seat just for a minute? And um, one other thing, um, anybody want to thank the Lord for sending Lorenzo our way today and thank the Lord for that? Isn't that awesome um, that God sent Lorenzo today? And you know, Lorenzo's got some family members here. Would you just kind of wave over there? I think I see Sonia there. And and Danny loves it whenever I point him out in public. He just loves that. But uh, awesome family there. You know, um, uh, Lorenzo's mother taught my wife how to make tamales. And just when I thought my wife couldn't get any hotter, Lorenzo's mom had to teach her how to make those tamales. And so that's why I think about those tamales all the time. I think I've eaten all the ones that they made this year, you know, at the, tama at the tamalada. And then Lorenzo's dad taught me how to weld. And so anyways, just thank the Lord that... Uh, Thank the Lord that I hadn't like gone blind or, uh, you know, burned myself with a welder because I'm that guy that I was, wish I was more handy than what I really am, you know? And so anyway, I just love Lorenzo and his whole family and thank the Lord for the word that he brought to us because I think it was significant, don't you? It's like God is bringing about resurrection in many facets of our lives. And as we wrap up um, today... Just a couple of things by way of reminder. Um, one of the ways that we uh, uh, live out the resurrection life is through our generosity and financial stewardship. You know, when you follow Jesus, it's not just about one facet of your life, you know, but it's really about giving him every facet of your life. And one of the things we like to invest in is people and spreading the kingdom of God in and through people. And in case you're new to City Tribe, we don't pass buckets or plates for our offerings. And um, by the way, if you're a guest with us or you know have not yet believed in Jesus or anything, 
uh, we totally understand if you don't participate in the financial part of things, uh, we hope that this service is just like a gift to you. But there are four ways that we take up our offering. Um, you can mail your off tithes and offerings in. You can text to tithe. You can uh, go to the giving stations located near the exits of the theater, or you can just go on our website. That's the simplest way, citytribe.church, and there's a gift link there, and we're just so appreciative of your generosity there. So before we worship through generosity today, let's stand up together. And one of the things that I love about this place is we like to say, we're a family, not a franchise around here, right on? So if you want to join hands with the brothers and sisters next to you, if you're comfortable to do that, that's okay. Um, if not, if there's someone next to you that's kind of a creeper, just say, hey, don't touch me, dude. Um, don't touch me, dude. Uh, others, some, some of you, it's like, don't touch me, dude. Others of you are like, you got a warm hand. <laughs> <laughs> so let me speak the word of benediction over you, dear brothers and sisters. May you walk from here, opening up the tomb, showing Jesus the stinky stuff, and allowing him to not only clean it up, but resurrect every facet of your life. Walk from here in abundant resurrection life and spread his kingdom and love to those in our world that desperately need it. You guys have an amazing Sunday and root for God's Dallas Cowboys today as they dominate. <laughs> have a great Sunday. to